Michael Erickson, welcome to the Train Right Podcast. Thanks, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Well, can you tell our listeners who may have not heard about your podcast and don't know about you, can you tell our listeners more about yourself? Yeah, so uh, I'm a triathlon coach. I'm from Finland, uh, Swedish-speaking Finn, actually, but I'm based in Portugal uh, for, what is it, for f- almost five years now. Uh, yeah, soon to be five years. And uh, my podcast is That Triathlon Show. Uh, the coaching business is called Scientific Triathlon, so so the podcast home is on scientifictriathlon.com. And I've been doing that since... 2017 i believe is when when i put out the first episodes and uh, mm-hmm. for the most part i've been doing two episodes per week every single week until actually in uh, july of 2021 is when i went uh, back down or not back down but i went down to one weekly episode just from a time management for time management reasons but yeah over that time i've done uh, a good 300 and something interviews and a bunch of solo episodes as well so there's plenty of of content there and uh yeah, the podcast is uh, something that I love doing, especially the interview styles when when I get to speak to really great coaches, researchers, and, and that's the focus. I'm not interviewing athletes, but coaches and researchers kind of like like you do and uh, well, your uh, uh, past guest on the show and had, we had a great, great chat then. So, uh, so yeah, the podcast is, is a fantastic tool for me to evolve as a coach myself by just getting getting direct access to to insights from from others that that are really good at what they do and uh, that helps me in my day-to-day job as a as a coach yeah and it's it is a really good podcast um i suggest anybody who's into this podcast and listening right now definitely go check it out um and i'm also like blown away at the r- rate that you record these podcasts you like pumping out two a week um I, I feel like with all the other coaching duties and stuff it's it I'm like, how do you do that, Michael? Um, so mad respect for that in the past. Um, I'm also like surprised to hear that because when we recorded, that was like probably 2018 or 2017. I mean, it was a while ago. It, it must have been at least 2018, if not 2019. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was definitely okay. not 2017, not in the first okay. year. Okay, good. Yeah, because I was like, how long ago do we do that? But it was, that was a, that was a fun episode. No idea which one it was, but, uh, uh, that's originally how, um, I got connected with, uh, with you, Michael and, uh, uh, coach Coop, Jason Coop put us, uh, put us in touch. So it's, uh, we've stayed in touch ever since. And, um, I've been meaning to have Michael on this podcast for quite some time and the, the time is, the time is not. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So for, for our listeners today, um, we've got a lot queued up and we're going to try to, kind of condense it all down into an hour, hour plus. Um, but in, in previous episodes with that triathlon show, you've talked about this concept of durability and that's where I want to start. So if you want to, let's get into that and then we'll keep on building and then go into this general or base prep and then move beyond. You go cool with that? Yeah, no, that's that's great. So durability, uh, you you have had Steven Seiler on to talk about that. I yeah. also talked mm-hmm. with Ed Bonder and Steven Seiler on on that topic. And just to define that, first of all, uh, okay. in simple terms, I, I would say that durability can be defined as uh, resistance to performance impairment when you're doing extended, prolonged endurance exercise, and and it's about when and how much you start to physically deteriorate when when you're doing work over that extended uh, period of time. So somebody who you might have two athletes with the same VO2 max, same threshold, but one of them starts to fatigue much sooner than, than the other or much more than the other when when the crucial point in a race comes and, and then the more durable athlete will be will be the one who wins. And as a triathlon coach and my primary focus as a coach is athletes that are working towards half and full Ironman races, durability is a very, very key attribute to be able to, to do, to race those, especially at a high level, because if you race a 7.3, for example, half Ironman at a high level, you're basically very close to your threshold the entire day for three and a half hours, four hours, four and a half hours, uh, depending on where at the spectrum you are. Of course, if you're more working towards 
completing rather than competing, then the intensity is lower. But but you still need some level of durability to be able to still be running after maybe six or seven hours of work that day. So so durability is, is a critical component of triathlon training, but that's the case as well with, as you know, a lot of cycling disciplines and cycling races. Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. Um, to kind of dive a little bit more into that definition too, I'm going to pick it apart just a bit. And when you talk about this physical um, deterioration of performance, what are some things that are going on to kind of rip that athlete down or, or cause them to slow down? Like what's going on? Yeah, I think the, well, some of the main mechanisms uh, when we're talking about prolonged endurance exercise, then we can assume that if, if we're talking about something that lasts longer than, you know, 20 minutes or so, then the, the reason that you're, uh, that you're fatiguing is not that you're going through acidosis or things like that you're not in the severe intensity domain you're somewhere between the first and second threshold perhaps and and in some cases in an ironman you might even be below the uh, the first lactate threshold lt1 so so the reasons are not acidosis or or metabolite buildup or or anything like that going on in the cells it's more about glycogen depletion is a is a big one uh, obviously so you want to try to be able to spare glycogen and replace as much glycogen as you can while you're exercising or competing. Um, another important one I think is, uh, is uh, thermal stress. So heat buildup and being, uh, being exposed to that for an extended period of time. And uh, then there's also a lot of potential, potentially a lot of central fatigue going on, especially in, in those really long races like an Ironman or in some sort of ultra ultra endurance race. Uh, so, so those are, are a few of the main ones. We Mark Burnley on his YouTube channel, All of Physiology, I think summarizes these fatigue mechanisms really well. He also, he was a guest on my podcast. So uh, we talk about that briefly and it's worth checking out. But but I would say that glycogen depletion, uh, thermal stress and uh, and central fatigue in, in the central nervous system, those are uh, a few of the main, uh, the main things going on there. And pertaining to, cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ways that we can take, uh, this concept of durability or even like this, this episode, we're going to focus primarily on training. And so from that training standpoint, we're really talking about say delaying fatigue or becoming resistant to fatigue over time. There's, there's three main concepts that pertain to that in the the lens of training if you will and that's stress strain and load can you talk about or like say give us a general definition of stress strain load and high level how that pertains to uh training for endurance athletes yeah sure so if we start with load because that's the simple one that everybody everybody knows it's if you're on the bike how much power are you putting out or if you're running what's your, the pace you're running or in the pool what's what's the pace that you're swimming it's basically the mechanical mechanical load your body needs to output a certain amount of of work so it's it's basically the, the training output and uh, then stress on the other hand is uh, i would at least this is this is how i would define these concepts stress is the metabolic and uh, also to some extent biomechanical cost of maintaining that output or that load so that means for example that you and I might be cycling at the same power or same power to weight, but our oxygen consumption, our oxygen uptake might be slightly different because one of us is more or less economical or efficient than, than the other. And in running, the differences in, in economy are quite a bit bigger than in cycling. So there, those sorts of things start to really matter. But uh, yeah, you can also look at the biomechanical costs. So for example, some in running when the muscular stress is a lot bigger than cycling. You, some one runner might have a lot more, you know, muscle damage that they experience even on a certain course. Let's say a, a hilly course with a lot of up and downhill running than another. So, um, so the biomechanical stress on one runner might be different than on on a second one. And and then finally, strain uh, is basically your response to the stress, to the meta- metabolic and the biomechanical cost of that output so so that means 
things like okay you need this amount of oxygen so how how much does your heart need to work because that might be different on a day-to-day uh, basis how what is your heart rate on one day is not necessarily the same as it is the the following day because it can depend on a lot of things like hydration uh, central central fatigue and and a bunch of other other things so so that's one aspect of strain on one day your heart might have to work harder to just to get the same amount of oxygen out to the muscles and uh, equally how much glycolysis do you need how much uh, how much do you need to activate the, those anaerobic pathways to uh, to sustain a certain pace or power so so those i would call aspects of strain so yeah basically you have it as a if you think of it as a pyramid you have the output at the top which is the the load and then you have the stress underneath which is more of a okay what is going on underneath the hood and then the strain is how is your body basically dealing dealing with that stress if if that makes sense yeah well yes it does make sense and i hope it makes sense to our listeners too if anybody's you know confused or like whoa there's a lot going on you're, you're right like there is a lot going on it, you know when it comes to training and how your body is perceiving the training both in the short term and in the long term Okay, because a lot of these load character characteristics, the stress characteristics and the strain have both acute and chronic or short and long term components to it, right? And when we're talking about training, we're talking about the the stress impulse response in both of those, uh, I'd say timing contexts, right, Michael? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's, that's something that maybe can be a bit confusing because of how, for example, training peaks are using the terminology differently, that stress is actually what what they call stress is what I call load. Stress is simply, okay, based on the power or the pace that you did for a certain duration and load is more of the chronic aspects. But, but I think you can look at it more from the perspective of load is load, but you can have the load that you do in one workout or the instantaneous load. And you can also look at it chronically. So you don't have to kind of uh, yeah, you, you can you can use that at both the chronic in the chronic perspective, time wise, or in the acute setting as well. And and one thing to add, I I guess in terms of strain, because I I feel like maybe I didn't explain strain very well. Sure. I think that R- RPE, uh, your rating of perceived exertion in a workout or after a workout, is a pretty good marker of strain. So you might do the exact same workout week one and week two and week three in a training plan. But it might feel different those different times, and and that is quite a good marker of uh, marker of strain. How how much did you? Because RPE is made up in our brain, and the brain is the master regulator of the body. So so it yeah. takes all of these inputs, glycolysis, the heart rate, uh, and 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 all of these things, thermal stress, what have you, and and basically makes a a composite score, and that is RPE. So so RPE is really good when you if you want to judge the strain of a particular workout oh for sure and that's and that's a that's a good point to bring up michael because it's uh something that i'm always asking my athletes on a very regular basis whether they you know recorded on training peaks which i highly encourage so for any of my athletes out there who are not currently recording rpe for single session workouts please do that um but also learning how to perceive that rate of that RPE, right? Rate of perceived exertion, scale of one to 10, 10 being a maximum effort, one being I'm just hanging out, sitting on the couch, uh, where, you know, how hard was that effort? Um, it could be the effort on the day, the interval itself, or a hill climb, whatever. That's what we're talking about in terms of an RPE. And to that point, Michael, is, you know, the other confusing bit too is like, uh, and you mentioned it before about like either heat dissipation or environmental factors contributing to some of this strain, um, you can go do, let's just say a hard hill climb day, I don't know, 4,000 foot of hill climb in a couple hours, right? Kind of a stressful day for, for most folk. And you can do that in 70 degree weather, or you can do that in a hundred degree weather, or you can do that in 10 degree weather, all in, uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit for for those <laughs> listeners who are wondering which which uh, which method we're using, but you can see where I'm going with this is is both you know in the 70 degree temperature you're gonna it's probably gonna be fine because that's normative, 
if you go hot or cold, there's going to be different strains to the system. You could call it stresses because technically it's kind of a biomechanical cost, but it's going to increase that rate of perceived effort or um, cause these your body to work harder for that given session of which you're probably not going to see it necessarily on power file or pace file or in the heart rate or anything like that, but it's there, it's real. And the athlete has to tell you that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And on the metabolic side, like if you compare the 70 and the 100 degree, you still have to, your oxygen consumption is not going to be too much different in those two weather conditions for the same power output. So, but the difference is that in the hotter conditions, you're just so busy shunting heat uh, to uh, to the skin and and trying to to get rid of it that way that that you have less to go to the muscle. So your heart just has to work that much harder to to pump out more blood than it would in those normal conditions. So that's a perfect example of even though the metabolic stress is the same, the strain is completely different. Exactly. And the reason why I bring this up and people are like, well, where are you going with this, Adam? The reason I bring this up is as much as I have been, I don't know, um, talking in training peak, training peaks language or CTS methodology, or, you know, uh, waving my WKO five, uh, fanboy flag or something like that. It's, um, it, all those tools are really important because these tools help us to identify, uh, communicate and investigate what's going on within an athlete, but they're not perfect. They're absolutely not perfect. And the tools are getting better. It seems like, you know, every year where we can, uh, you know, have this lens to view what is going on, you know, inside and outside of an athlete's body to, um, know how stressed <laughs> they are from the loads we impose and the strains that, that are going on, but you know, like nothing's perfect. And in as much as we're even using this language to describe it's, it's also imperfect. Um, so again, kind of getting to the point that I said in, in this, is that in this intro is to talk with Michael and start to learn how we can look at some of these things that we may take as ordinary or something that we think we know, and you, you may not know as much. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and I think, uh, if, if you want to tie those, those, those concepts of stress train and load to durability, just to close the loop on that one a little bit, sure. uh, the. The, the thing with durability is that let's say you're out on a five hour bike ride, then you're, and you're trying to keep a constant power. You're, you're going at a constant 200 Watts or whatever it may be. And, uh, your load is the exact same throughout that ride. Mm -hmm. Your stress is probably also very similar. It might change a little bit in terms of how you, how your, your output is fueled and uh, the composition maybe of aerobic and anaerobic might change a bit, but, but it's probably for that sort of steady effort, aerobic effort, it's, it's probably quite constant throughout most of the ride. What changes a lot there is the strain and, but then durability is okay. How much can we prevent that strain from increasing too much and too early? So yeah, that's just to tie them all together a little bit and, and understand, okay, so how, how do these things relate to durability that we started talking about? Yeah, 100%. And we'll get into like how we become more durable here pretty quick. But I, I think that, um, and we might even have to edit this analogy out because it might break down very quickly, Michael, but I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> when uh, I believe when you were talking to Siler and, and I also interviewed him, there was an analogy of a board right? Call it a bridge or whatever, but like a board with, you know, a couple cinder blocks on either side. And this board can be, um, it, it'll hold a load, right? It'll hold a, a weight of something that's resting in the middle of it. And that, let's just call it a bucket. You can pour water into that bucket and it's going to stress, right? It's going to stress that board um, and it's going to become warped. Okay. And, and you realize over time that you can only hold a certain amount of water before you need to take that board out and put in a sturdier one or something like this. And it's not a perfect analogy, but you can then poke a few holes in the bucket and it'll have this flux of the water coming out and you say, okay, well that holds up a little bit better. And you keep on putting this water in and you try to decide which board is going to hold what load more appropriately. And through that process, you can, you can then use these like these analogies are kind of that, that vision of like, 
what kind of board is appropriate for how much, say, stress or, or load? It's, and this is where the analogy is starting to break down. But um, the whole concept there of what uh, Dr. Seiler was talking about from, say, an, an engineer standpoint is how much of a tolerance like this athlete can can have over time in order to achieve like their Ironman goals or their uh, Cape Epic goals or whatever these these things are. And so I, I'll throw it out there as an analogy, an example, if if uh, if that is helpful for listeners or for the context of this conversation. And if we delete it out, we delete it out. But start to think about that sort of metaphor. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, I've seen a, a video actually on Dr. Seiler's YouTube channel where he, mm. he talks about that and uh, and I've, I've, he explains it quite quite well there, I think, as the deformation. Quite better the... than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was his example, so he'd better uh, have it right. <laughs> you, you, just, you, you just try to, to convey, convey it from him, so that's fine. Uh, and I, I, I got it, what you were talking about. Um, but the yeah, the deformation in the board is is kind of what he talks about as the analogy to the strain. So the stress is the same as long as you have the same amount of water in the bucket. Uh, but uh, but the deformation, so one board might deform more than than another board, and uh, and that's kind of the the strain. And I guess what you're getting at is kind of when, for example, planning the training of an athlete. So how how much stress and strain do you want them to experience so that they can then adapt positively to it and become stronger become more durable with time exactly exactly so let's take that analogy and learn how you can become more durable um, over time to get more success from your your training we're going to kind of pivot here a little bit and then swing back to durability but i want to talk about the base phase of training and Michael, when we were putting this together, I know we were kind of kind of going back and forth because like, well, it's not really what I call it, Adam. It's not really what I do. And I'm like, yeah, kind of same thing. So when when, when people are talking about their their base period, what what are you talking about, Michael? Or what's what's another way that we can think about this? Yeah, I, I listened to your recent interview with Colin Moore, and uh, and I really I think he he defined it really well. Anything that makes the athlete better in the long term, I, I would agree with that. So so I don't yeah, I, I don't necessarily think in terms of base build uh, and peak taper or like any sort of, you know, trying to block the year off in, in those ways. But most of what you do can be thought of as base training really. Like if you think about it when you're training for an Ironman, especially in the specific build up to the race you're probably out there doing lots of hours at a fairly low intensity kind of maybe at your your first like say threshold or slightly below it and that's what traditionally has been called base training long long slow miles it, it's not necessarily super slow but but it's also not it's it's in the in the moderate intensity domain so so i think that yeah for me base is if, if, what what I think about when I hear base is really anything that makes the athlete better in the long term. So so if we're preparing them for the Olympic Games, uh, short course triathlon, and we're doing a bunch of sprint work in the last two weeks to make sure that if it comes down to a sprint for the finish line, they will get that gold rather than the silver. That's maybe not contributing to their you know, being better in the long term, that's something that definitely can make a big, big difference in the short term, but not necessarily in the long term. But most of the, the rest of the training that an athlete does in the year can almost be thought of as, as base training. So yeah, that's that's how I think about it in, in broad uh, in broad strokes. Yeah, and I think that's, it's super important. And I brought this up in the, the intro aspect of it, but I, I think that so often athletes as well as coaches, I'll raise my hand, in that um have or currently think that everything needs to be like segmented um in order to be organized in a very appropriate way it's like no every everything builds off itself you know one um you know one season to the next and sometimes you might even have a you know a gap season where there's not much going on but that also kind of builds and there's so it's more infinite it's not finite 
in terms of how an athlete is being built over time. And that's, that's really what I want our listeners to start to think about as opposed to it's January, it's base phase. Here we go. It's really not how it works. Yeah. I think we love as cyclists and triathletes, uh, especially, I, I think runners are maybe a bit different, but different, mm-hmm. but cyclists and triathletes are love formulas and equations and totally. um, recipes, if you will, for training success. And, and I think the appeal of thinking thinking about very specific, you know, blocked off periods that are base and build and what have you, is that is the appeal or the thought of that if you structure your training in a certain way, you will get a better, better training outcome. But but I think that, that kind of it boxes us in and we think inside the box rather than outside of it. And uh, as you said at the beginning, and and yeah, at least this is I think how training has been popularized in the last couple of decades, I, I would say, or training training structure. And, and I think that it, to some extent, I mean, it, it does help, of course, for self-coach athletes in particular to, to have a bit of a guideline for how to structure their training, because it's clear that structure is better than unstructured. So in that sense, I think that the whole base build, uh, base and build and, uh, and, peaking or tapering that kind of Joe Friel popularized, it does a lot of good for a lot of people in that it gets them to structure their training. But I also think that you shouldn't become a slave to it and it's not necessarily the best way to train. Uh, I think that it works really well for some time, but then you have to, I guess, broaden your perspectives and broaden your horizons a bit. And, uh, and yeah, just think about things not in so formulaic terms. Yeah, hundred percent. So, you know, start somewhere, get organized, but then evolve beyond. And that's where yep. we're talking about And that evolve beyond is dialing in for that individual athlete, whether it is you and your coach or you coaching yourself. And that's what we'll talk about today. So, um, when it comes to this general training standpoint, and if we go back to stress, strain and load, as it pertains to volume and intensity. Um, I kind of, I want to walk through like how you're using volume and intensity while keeping an eye on stress, strain, and load when you're working with your athletes. And I'd say, because you work with primarily triathletes, we'll probably focus more on like Ironman and half Ironman um, examples. So just in terms of volume and intensity first, can, can I hear a little bit of what Michael is looking at or prescribing when it comes to uh, preparing an Ironman athlete for their race? Yeah. So first of all, no matter what the athlete is preparing for, it's really important to think about the full context. So it's not just the the goal distance, uh, but also the goal in terms of the achievement or performance the athlete wants to get out of that. So is it to win a professional race or is it to finish their first Ironman uh, within the the time limit? Uh, What is their competitive level? What is their training age, their chronological age, their muscle fiber typology and injury history and strengths and weaknesses? And those things will all then play a role as, as well as, okay, how much time do you have until un, until the race? So so there are just a bunch of factors, a bunch that I didn't list off as well that you need to look at. So, so I, every case is unique, but some generalizations that I can make for, for Ironman is that the highest volume tends to come closest to the race because Ironman is really such an endurance driven event, even a fast age grouper might try to go for a nine hour time and and somebody looking to com- complete might go for a 16 hour time or a 17 hour time so so it's really endurance driven so so we need to do a fairly high volume of endurance and it makes sense to do that close to the race so that you can have all of those adaptations with you as you go into into the event and also the durability because you build that when with a high volume of training in general not just long individual workouts. Uh, so since we so, know, yeah, so sorry. For uh, like one quick distinguishable thing, if, if we're looking at Ironman Arizona, which is October, right? Mm. Um, 
we're not having our high for that particular athlete and say they're only going to race that, for example, you're not going to have the highest volume be in April to really get them built no. up. No, okay. no, it's, go, it's going to be in, in September and August, August, September, October, uh, tapering off, obviously, bef- before the race. So, and that's yeah, very, the, the reason I bring that up is it's, it's counter cultural to this like base prep build, more yeah. or less, right? And there's some specificity that'll go on there, but I just, I wanted to point that out uh, to our listeners uh, real quick. Yeah, yeah. And, and since we, in many cases, we know that this will be the case, we will do our highest volume uh, closer to the race or closest to the race, then we can use those earlier parts of the season to just work on work on other things. So build up your VO2 max, your your muscular resilience, and and we need to first of all get the athlete ready to handle what they need to do closer to the race. So if we know that to even be able to you know finish the race, perhaps this athlete will need to do let's say 10 to 14 hours per week for six weeks uh, in the specific mm-hmm. preparation for the race before the taper. Then we need to build up the volume so that they they're ready to handle that and uh, and build up the uh, the musculoskeletal system as well so, so it's able to to handle that so 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 that plays into how we structure the training and uh, we also know that we won't be doing or we won't be I'm not saying that we won't be doing but we won't be putting a massive emphasis of we won't be prioritizing high intensity work in that specific period leading into the race. So if we if we think that this athlete could benefit from high intensity work, then we should do that earlier. And in some cases, maybe Ironman Arizona is, doesn't work as well in this example. But let's say the athlete is doing a June Ironman, and their volume period for that Ironman is going to be in May and April. Then January, February, March is when they have an opportunity to work on some higher intensities. Really, when they're still not at that uh, super peak volume and specific Ironman training. So, so that's, so that's another aspect of it that when, when the intensity falls, uh, will for an Ironman athlete often be, be earlier. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's how I would generalize it anyway. Uh, so, so yeah, those are a couple of, of aspects of intensity and, and volume when it comes to, to the Ironman. Perfect. Um, when you're working with a, a half Ironman athlete, would that would would anything change in terms of uh, big picture sort of structure from um, preparation to this like race specific time period? Yes, but and the half Ironman I feel is even more context dependent because the half Ironman can be raced in such a wide variety of ways. So you have the at the at the fastest end of the spectrum you have pro male athletes racing it in close to three and a half hours, and they're at 90 to 95 percent of threshold the entire way and it's just a very intense event it's a, but obviously it's still an endurance event and but but you need a lot of quite specific hard work to to be able to do that also some of the fastest age group athletes uh can race it in a intense way uh a little bit further from tre- threshold, but close to threshold. Yeah. For most of the time, if you're racing at four hours, even four and a half hours, then then you're definitely outputting some some quite quite solid percentage of threshold numbers there. But then on the other hand, if you're somebody working to uh, to complete a half Ironman and you will do that in six to seven hours, then it's it's closer to what an Ironman is for a professional athlete, which they now do in seven and a half hours. So. So it's it's all about the endurance, and and in that case, if for that athlete, we're looking at something similar to the Ironman conversation we just had. But on the other hand, for the very competitive athlete racing at four hours, three and a half hours, four and a half hours, then uh, the prioritization might look very different. And and really, it comes down to what is doing a gap analysis and figuring out what is it that the athlete is lacking in what bridge what do they need to bridge what gaps do they need to bridge in order to be as competitive as they want to knowing what their goals are and what the event demands are i still think that having quite specific training in the final period before the race but that might not necessarily be a long period it might be 
three, four weeks of very specific training and then some tapering. It might be longer in some cases, but it doesn't have to be excessively long. Uh, that is generally the case for most athletes. So then it comes back to, okay, until we get to that period, three to four weeks, or let's say with taper five to six weeks before the race, what do we need to work on? What, what is it that the athlete needs to work on? Is it Are they limited by their a particular discipline, like the swim? Do we need to focus on the swim? Or if you're thinking more about the metabolic side, are they limited by their VO2 max or more by their ability to hold a higher percentage of VO2 max? And, and those aspects will then, or are they limited by durability and, and endurance? So there are all sorts of scenarios there. And, and really what, what you do can vary so much from athlete to athlete. But, but you have to just sit down and think about what does this athlete have and what do they need? Where are the biggest potentials for improvement and work on those first and then gradually tick off as many as you can until you get into that period where you still want to put in some specific training for the event. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. And, and you're, you're checking off all the right things in my opinion for, especially that um, the individualized approach to, uh, to training, which is really hard to talk about on a podcast. I think the way that you and I operate in, in our coaching um, spheres, if you will, when working with athletes. So, I mean, you're, do an awesome job of answering, uh, you know, questions, even though you don't have like all these like examples that you would in a, uh, you know, like a clinical case, if, if you were working with an athlete. Right. But I think one thing you said really resonated with me. I, th I think this might've even been like in our discussion beforehand, but the hinge point of, are you going to compete or complete these events? And I think with the half Ironman, for example, when you talked about, yeah, well, you can bang this thing out in three and a half hour. They're like athletes can three and a half or seven. Cause it's a very, um, it's a very interesting duration of event. Um, when you have, uh, professionals and age groupers and the energy systems required to do that on a day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. It's, 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 it's a crazy feat. I think for the, what, the way the pros are racing it now with, uh, three and a half hours. And so, but, um, yeah, uh, take nothing away from the the people that are out there for seven hours because that's that's an impressive feat in itself to do an endurance exercise for seven hours. So, but yeah, it's just you have to yeah. not coach the event; you have to coach the athlete. That's that's the key thing. Well, hundred percent, and that's why I bring it up. I mean, mad respect to both ends for sure. I'd even say tip my hat even more for those who you know are out there for seven because that's I mean that's that is hard. That's a death march. Um, but I think just from the interesting observational side of things of how that, that hinge point of the energy systems required and then knowing, yeah, exactly what kind of plan are you following in order to get you to your goal, right? Because if you, if all you're doing is following this, um, you know, this pro triathletes method of how they were successful at this, and then you try to do all of that, which is generally probably going to be way too much intensity it's, it's not going to serve you very well. Right. Yeah. No, no, 100%. It's, you, you can't, you can take, you can take a plan from somebody if you mm -hmm. know why you're doing it, you know, that, okay, my limitations are the same, or you, you look at the plan and see, okay, this plan clearly targets a certain limitation or a certain aspect that I also need to improve. So, so I'm just going to take this plan and that's fine. The, the problem is obviously that, I mean, even not every professional athlete trains in a great way uh it's so it, they they might almost have success in spite of how they're training rather than because of how they're training in in some ways so and and in triathlon i think i think in cycling it's very different because in cycling the professionals especially on the men's side obviously unfortunately not so much or as much on the female side but they are well supported decently paid they have good teams around them and good coaches around them triathlon the financial side of things in professional triathlon is so so bad still even though it is improving that yeah a lot of pros can't afford a coach or uh, or not a good coach and yeah you just end up if you follow what the professionals are doing it's it's hit and miss whether it's good or not but even if it's a good plan for that athlete obviously it needs to fit what you're doing so as you say so so you need to be aware of why you're doing what you're doing. That's, that's very critical. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent point. 
Um, so when we're talking, let, let's say, let's add a little bit more context to these uh, Ironman, half Ironman athletes. <laughs> the context of time crunched, which most of us are, let's face it. Um, how do you then influence stress, strain, load to achieve like this, uh, even progressive overload, if you will, during a general training period? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, when it comes to progressive overload, I think what one thing that I do as a coach is I really don't stress about progressive overload from a week to week, month to month perspective, as much as uh, taking a bigger picture and looking at it almost as a year to year progression. Uh, I think it's, and it's def definitely something that I've made mistakes with in the past with trying to progress things week to week or month to month. And you can do that if you're working far from your capacity, but if you're working close to your capacity, then it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a way that you can potentially burn out and, and do too much and get injured. So, so I look at progressive overload as, uh, and it's something that I see in a lot of self-coach athletes that they almost start to obsess with progressive overload and uh, to their detriment and, and things go uh, awry. So, so I've, I would encourage athletes to look at progressive overload as a very wide perspective, like look at a year. So if you train 500 hours last year, can you train 550 this year? That's your progressive overload right there. Uh, and uh, you will keep improving if you're consistent and there is some as some element of pro uh, progressive overload of course in your uh, specific workouts for example and building up your workouts from when you get back into training after a season break to you're not going to do as hard uh, quality intervals as you're doing right before your key race so there's obviously an element of overload there but uh, yeah I, I would just stray away from looking too much at what we do last week and we have to do more next week. Quite often we just repeat the week and your progressive overload is that this three week period, you, you managed to do the same thing as you did uh, a previous three week block, but you did it with slightly more energy, slightly more quality in your, in your hard workouts and without feeling quite as tired at the end. That's, uh, that's a success. So, so th that's, one thing uh, to, to address first. Then secondly, I think that uh, when we're talking about time crunch athletes, uh, this is something that I wrote down in my notes, is that these athletes are often stress-rich athletes in terms of other stressors of their lives, like uh, work, family, and other commitments. So you can't just try to maximize the stress in the training training load that they're taking on or or the stress for that matter again coming back to load being the output stress being the uh the metabolic or biomechanical cost for the output because if you're carrying a lot of other stressors then your reaction to that load and stress might not be to actually adapt and improve it might be to to not improve or to even regress yeah. potentially get injured or get overtrained so so there is that danger when when you're trying to you know make a program harder that it won't work the way you planned it so so I, I think that it's it's more about trying to be first of all be really really consistent and be consistent over as long a period of time as you can and, and really try to figure out okay where are the points in a year when an athlete really loses that consistency and try to uh, when you're working with an athlete, help them see that and help them in whatever way they can reduce those moments when consistency breaks down. B because that's, that's where you're really going to make the biggest different, difference, I feel. I think uh, another common issue is that, yeah, it's the same issue really, but you see a lot of people that want to get more TSS for the same amount of time, training stress score and training peaks terminology. And, and that's definitely not the way that I try to go about things it's it really is okay how many how many hours do you have look at that as one of your constraints and then it comes back to that those aspects we talked about before look at the context the goals the uh, training age chronological age current ability level and so on do a gap analysis see where are the biggest limiters that this athlete needs to overcome to get closer to their goals and start with one at a time and in many cases for these time crunch athletes, it might be that their endurance is the, and 
metabolic fitness is the biggest limitation, which means that the way to overcome that quite often is just try to get in good aerobic work, try to make room for a long workout every week or every other week if you can, but yeah, get, get in a good amount of consistent volume as much as you can, but it doesn't have to be hard volume if that is the case and that your, you know, your endurance or your metabolic fitness is your weakness. So that's where the whole maximizing TSS is a really a red herring. It can, it can be detrimental because you're just making yourself even more, even more of a, you know, glycolysis driven athlete and you're going to burn out of glycogen very soon in your races. If you're always going for those harder workouts that make you feel a little bit tired because you think that you have to compensate for not having as much time. So that's just one example. It's not the case for everybody, but, but look at your gap analysis and take it from there. I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. More TSS is not better. What? (laughs) I'm, I'm queuing you up there for a very I, important thing that you said. And in, in even more important, because again, I think that this is where cycling and triathlete um, loves their numbers, loves their algorithms and their formulas. Man, what you said was awesome. It's like, you know, don't maximize the TSS or even the, like the CTL, meaning like, um, uh, you know, if you hit 100 CTL last year, uh, hitting... 120 this year, not necessarily better, not necessarily the goal, because there's, there's so much context that needs to be in there. And I think so pertaining to, well, first of all, why would shooting for 120 this year, if you hit 100, why would that be bad? Just in, in a general standpoint, it could be too much, uh, simply. And, and also Keep in mind that training stress score, uh, even though its name is stress, it it's a measure of load of output of training output. It doesn't tell you anything about how that output was created, what metabolic, uh, what what the stress was for that output. Uh, it doesn't give you any context uh, to it really. Also, it's just based on. It's a flawed metric in my, in my opinion, and I, I mean, yeah. we could go deep into this, but it's all based on threshold, which might be fine when you're working below threshold, but when you're working above threshold, I think it, it really breaks down uh, and it, yeah, it becomes really, because all athletes, as you know, are so individual when we're talking about the work above threshold in, in what they can do and how they can do it. So, so I think when, when you're measuring work there, it's, uh, it's not going to be an apples to oranges comparison compared to the work you're doing below threshold. Yeah, hundred percent. And in, and I'll say what I'm about to say with this caveat is I use these tools. I talk about these tools on the podcast. I talk about them with my athletes. I think that they are good for what they are. However, they are only as good as how you can be, or how you um, manage them in your own realm, whether it's coached or self coach now, and I'll say, so here's my point, hundred CTL built up anaerobically versus aerobically is a very different CTL, right? Yep. Like you can't even get there. Like the way energy systems work and anaerobic, anaerobic, I mean, you can argue that too, but, but my point here is if you just go and, and ride, you know, zone one or um, in, in the three zone system, zone one, and, and build yourself up to hundred versus in the three zone system. If you go and ride exclusively in zone three to somehow build up to hundred CTL, uh, it's a, just a very different load the way that works out. Right. Yeah. And yeah, it's, and, and, and importantly, different stress, different strain. So the exactly. reaction of the body is going to be very different because the body reacts to the stress and the strain, uh, not necessarily to the load. Hundred percent. So, kind of to bring this back home is you say, well, okay, Adam and Michael, like this would be a listener listening to this, be like, okay, so I thought you were tracking with like these metrics that I can then use to apply to my own training. Now I'm just confused. Well, so now what, Michael? Um, how do we unconfuse the listeners when it comes down to? using some of these metrics to become more durable over time should should we just forego that if, if that is what the listener has been using for the past three years should we keep on going or how, how do we navigate this this sticky critical point we're in 
Yeah, well, first of all, I'm like you, I do use them as a tool. It's a good, yeah. training stress score is a good measure of, of load, of training output. But that's, that's you need to know that that is a, a very big limitation. And, and yeah. I think it's sure. often given much more credence than, than it, it should get. Uh, and actually what I wish I could do as a coach is to, for me to be able to see an athlete's training stress score and performance management chart and everything, but hide it so that the athlete can see it themselves because I think it does more harm than good. And and I still think in terms of a measure of even load, I default more to training volume, like just pure hours, yep. because I I mean maybe it's not that the same if you start working with a new athlete that you don't know, but if it's an athlete that I've been working with, I know my general coaching approach, and I know what I've been doing with this athlete more or less. So so I know that what ten hours means and what fifteen hours means and what five hours means and 20 hours means and and volume gives a good indication of how much load they've been been doing because it's not as if within 10 hours things are going to massively shift when when i coach an athlete from from one period of the year to the next other than maybe when they're just working back into fitness after the season break uh it's it's still going to be relatively steady um steady enough in terms of the overall load and stress that that hours and volume really can tell you a lot about what what the athlete is doing and importantly it's also in terms of the data integrity it's it's a it's a metric that is way way more difficult to mess up because i mean how many times has this happened to you adam that you have an athlete that something went wrong with their file and it thinks that they biked for 99 hours and they somehow got 10,000 tss <laughs> when the, it's or, a good day michael that's a good day yeah yeah <laughs> and and then the whole like of like i'm attuned to those things and i notice them when they happen but i think a lot of athletes yeah. not don't necessarily do that and and a lot of the you know the numbers they see are actually based on potential measurement errors that that are not deleted or taken care of so so i think i think for the listener i would look at hours first and yep. look at tss second but with the hours Basically, your job is then take the hours that you have. If you have 10 hours, take those 10 hours, try to optimize your training. As we talked about doing a gap analysis for your event and your goals, uh, do the best you can with those hours, with what you need to work on. And then you know that, okay, if I did the best I could with my 10 hours, that's that's all that I could do. Then it doesn't matter what my TSS is. And then let's say you come back next year and you're suddenly doing 12 hours, but you're still following the same process of doing the best you can with those 12 hours. Then you can see that, okay, this time last year I was doing 10 hours, now I'm doing 12 hours. So, and I'm still following my same uh, very good good process based on on good fundamental thinking about training. Then you're, and if things are, you're responding well to the training, you're doing 12 hours now, you did 10 hours last year, then you can assume that, okay, I'm a little stronger now or I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little bit more load. So hopefully I can adapt to, to that stronger load than i did before because the content might not be massively different so I, I think that's that's a good way to to look at to look at these things look at the hours and and maximize what you can do with those hours yeah that's just it and i think that coming comes back to several points i've mentioned before in this podcast but if you're in, if you're only looking at you know one thing or two things or whatever and thinking that's the holy grail like tss like ctl um i, I think it's flawed I'd even say, you know, looking at total volume um, would be flawed. I think it's probably even better than, say, a CTL because you have to look at the quality or lack thereof of, of the volume and, and also um, how that could uh, change an athlete's physiology. So, uh, but what you just said, I mean, that's 100% agree. And I think that that's, you know, kind of a wonderful way to answer that, that time crunched um, athlete um, conundrum that many of us are in. Yeah, yeah. And and just to be clear, when I said maximize the hours you have, again, we talked about this already, but it doesn't mean maximize the work done or the output done. It means it means coming at it from the process of understanding your body and your physiology and what you need to improve and then doing work to address those main limitations that you have in relation to your goals. Exactly. So some of those limitations... Um could be a weakness in an athlete versus a, a strength. And when we talk about like strengths and weaknesses, when it pertains to a, uh, uh, general prep phase, um, can I, can I ask you how you address strength and weaknesses during this general preparation? 
Yeah, so so it, it really is about, again, doing that gap analysis for mm-hmm. the athlete. So every, every year I do a, well, uh, basically sit together with the athlete and while well, they do a fill out a pretty big sort of planning questionnaire if you will first before the season and so we know kind of what race do they want to do what do they want to achieve and then we sit down together and and we talk about it and maybe refine some of the goals and make sure that they're that we're aligned on on all of that and and then it's my job really to take those goals and uh and look at okay where is the athlete now where do they need to be and and what are what is it that's limiting them so 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 it's so a weakness as you allude to i think doesn't have to be something that you need to improve. For example, for most of my triathletes, they do not, they're not going to the Olympics. They're not going to sprint with Alexi and Christian Blumenfeld. So we don't need to work on sprinting with them. Uh, that's, that's a weakness for a lot of people, but it's not a limitation in any way. So, so it's not something that's going to be probably addressed in our, in our training at all, because we don't need it. Uh, but a limitation might be that this, this athlete, they, they tend to crumble after 10 kilometers on the run in the half Ironman. And, uh, and we need to somehow address that. It's probably not a running issue because they're running really well in training. They run good open half marathons. It's more of a durability issue when, or it might be a fueling issue. We need to look at those two potential aspects. It might be a either a bike pacing issue. Do we need to be more conservative on the bike or do we need to simply improve bike threshold to be able to ride at a lower percentage of threshold at the same speed and the same output those are all options so so you have to consider them kind of rank the probabilities and uh, and then just start working on them either one at a time or some of them you can sometimes work on in parallel but uh, having some sort of way of prioritizing what are the big limitations for age groupers for example swimming is often a big weakness but the potential gains with an athlete that is somewhat time crunched are also often quite a lot smaller than the potential gains on gains on the bike and the run. So even though swimming might be the biggest weakness and limitation in terms of an athlete achieving, you know, or in terms of where they could be compared to their genetic potential, if you want to call it that, it's not necessarily the one that we'll work on because it's not necessarily the one that will give us the most gains when an athlete has a limited amount of time to train. So so that's an overview, I guess, of how how I work at that. But but the point is, yeah, we're during the general preparation phases, we are working on as many of these things that we as we can. And we just try to kind of then every once in a while like look back at okay, do we still have the same uh, do we need to up- update the gap analysis and and what what is the next next on the list to improve? That's basically how the process works. Yeah. Yeah. And so the things that I really liked out of that answer, if you will. And I think that's important for our listeners is, um, first of all, the terminology, right? Weakness versus limiter, because it's different, right? So you can look at a general physiology and have a weakness, but pertaining to the goal, a weakness doesn't matter, but a limiter may, right? That can then help you determine within whatever training period, how you structure it up via your gap analysis. And I think that will help bring some structure into how athletes kind of shape up their year. And then with the strengths too, strengths are, you know, you could call also call those opportunities um, of which that may all, you know, that strength may always be there and therefore you don't have to train it during the general preparation time period. I mean, for uh, go with a cycling example for a lot of my sprinters, I don't train their sprint a whole lot. Like if they're truly genetic gifted sprinters, I just make sure I don't mess it up. Right. So kind of in the preparation general, um, build phase, I'm, I'm doing things to make sure I don't mess it up. And I'm really working on durability a lot on, um, uh, uh, basically endurance and glycolytic power production, and then freshen them up and get them ready with some specificity going into a main event. And that it, just for my, as quick of a example as I can, that's kind of how, you know, an opportunity and a strength would be um, identified in a gap analysis and then applied during a preparation time period. Yeah, no, that makes, makes perfect sense. And, and I totally agree with that. Like you, you do have, you, you have to be aware of the opportunities as well, the strengths of the athlete and, and, yeah. Uh, and yeah, yeah, take, take them into account and, and not, not just ignore them. Yep. Yep.
Okay. So kind of moving on to, to strength training, uh, all within the, the, the lens and context of building a better durable athlete over time. Do you use strength training for majority of your athletes? And if you could just like assume some, some context around that, um, how do you use strength training in, in this general preparation phase? Yeah. So, so just to clarify, when you're talking about building a durable athlete here, because yeah. the terminology can be a bit uh, ambiguous, uh, it could mean a resilient, like for example, an, an athlete that is resilient to injury, uh, but sure. or are we still talking about durability in terms of the ability to withstand fatigue and experience minimal deterioration in physical performance capacity? Let's go with the performance capacity side of things, because I think it'll help to simplify our conversation. Yeah, well, the way I use strength training is, um, I, th I think it's, it's not necessarily so much related to that aspect of durability, even though there is research out there showing that, for example, strength training has helped cyclists uh, maintain a better gross, gross efficiency um, further into their long, in, into a long aerobic ride. So that is basically that's your durability right there they have less strain or less deterioration so so it is parallel even though that's not the main reason that i do strength training because that is for me more so about a little bit about or quite a bit about resilience to injury but but also about just general capacity to express force not just in a fatigued state but in a in any state so just improving biomechanically things like uh, rate of force development and, and so on, which for for all sports, but for running in particular, I, I think is is really important. But either way, the way the way I do it is pretty standard. Uh, there's a set of exercises that that are targeting key muscle groups and movements that the athletes do year round. I don't, not all of my athletes do strength training in the gym, but many of them do. Um, so some of them that don't do strength training in the gym, they still do a, at least a couple of circuits per week. It's going to be 20 minute circuits that target their core, their hips and glutes and their lower legs, uh, just for, to make sure that they can do all of the endurance training that they're doing without getting injured. And these can generally be done at home with minimal equipment, but for the athletes that, uh, that can uh, do work in the gym and that I think will benefit from doing work in the gym, which it comes really comes down to a sort of time cost analysis for many athletes that have a reasonable reasonably big time budget i definitely have them working in the gym for some athletes that are kind of on the edge of like we would ideally like to do a bit more endurance training with them i might actually skip out on the gym training just to prioritize the endurance training but for those athletes that are working in the gym basically three to four weeks as they get back into the gym after the season break would be just preparation work with minimal weights and focusing on good movement quality of each exercise. And then moving on to increasing the weights to more moderate weights and uh, a moderate rep range, or you could almost call it hyp a hypertrophy rep range or uh, sort of a hypertrophy work, even though for endurance athletes, as we know, they're quite unlikely to have any real hypertrophy, but for me, it's more about it, that working as a transition phase between the preparation and the maximum strength phase and, and the power phase. And then the maximum strength phase would be, again, keeping those same exercises, but using heavy weights and, and low reps. So, so that's, that's the basic periodization and just working through a month or so of, of each of those periods uh, kind of is, is what it is. And then when we get closer to the races, I tend to scale back on the gym. So let's say an athlete is doing two times 45 minutes to an hour in the gym per week in their winter when they're far out from races, then as they get to the last kind of month or so before the race and do really specific training and quite demanding endurance training, we might scale it back to two times 30 minutes in the gym or one times 30 to 40 minutes, depending on, depending on the athlete. Uh, and well, the time in the maximum strength phase basically can be quite long. So as I said, three to four weeks of preparation, uh, three to four weeks of that moderate weight, moderate reps. And then we basically stay in the maximum strength phase until until we need to scale down again for the competitions. So, so because in the research, we have seen that quite long strength training program at a maximum strength um, range of weights and repetitions 
has produced really good results in terms of performance improvements. So, so, so I'm not afraid of staying there for for quite long, as long as the athlete doesn't feel that it's detrimental for their endurance training. But that is something that you have to take into account on an individual basis. I do have some athletes that are quite sensitive to gym work, and with them, it's definitely a more scaled scaled back version and yeah. selecting exercises appropriately. Uh, so yeah, a couple of other points just quickly that I, I do like to use a mix of uh, unilateral and bilateral exercises. I think it's, mm-hmm. especially for triathletes that are doing running, it is important to get those unilar- unilateral exercises in. And uh, and also I like to get in some power work where you just really focus on on a, on explosiveness in the concentric part of the of the exercise. So in a squat, for example, lowering down slowly, but shooting up with, with power and explosiveness, and then the, the weights would be would be lower. So so those are a couple of additional points that I include in the in the strength training. Yeah, um, I'd I'd say I do it very very similarly, um, and uh, there are just a few talking points too, like manipulating uh, directional forces as well as uh, like a load and velocity in order to create a different stimulus. That's what he's talking about, about unilateral, bilateral, and um, uh, the explosive movements that Michael was talking about. Um, yeah, that, that, that is, that's a very good process. I like that. And I think that uh, for those listeners kind of wondering about the strength training, I'd say rewind, go back, listen to that aspect as it kind of pertains to performance, but also the injury prevention. I didn't mean to like sidestep that. Um, because I think it's super important. And I also have like the majority of my athletes doing something that is off the bike or away from the run or something to, um, I always say to move better and to keep the muscles activated. And effectively what I am saying is to, you know, prevent an injury of, of some kind like that. And I think to, you know, back to the point that you were just saying, um, in terms of um, rate of force development or, uh, making sure that these nerves and muscles are firing accordingly, whether you're ground-based or not. Um, it's, it's super important in my opinion to do something not sport-based to maintain that. Yeah. Yeah. And for cyclists, uh, like that's, that's a really important point because if you, if you're only doing work on your bike, then also things like your uh, your bone density is, is going to degrade and especially as you age then you're going to be much more likely to have let's say something like a fall in winter just give you a you know, let, have you break a hip and then just impair your quality of life for uh, for a long time so yeah. so these things are real considerations not just relating to performance to the performance in your goal events but just to longevity in, in and quality of life yeah 100 percent. okay now it's kind of time for that uh that, that golden question or kind of this uh, this transitional sort of time period um as we move from general to another focused time period michael what what is this non-general phase of training what do you call that i would call it specific preparation or the race specific period and so when you decide to move on from general to more specific, how do you decide that? Like, when does that happen in an athlete? And are there, are there key markers that you're looking for to make that decision? Um, yeah, so there are not marker, markers per se. I look more so to the, to the racing calendar of the athlete and, uh, but so then it's there a are timing component. The time it's a timing component, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And and also it depends on the distance of the well on the event in general. So sure. for example, the specific preparation for an Ironman would be significantly longer than the specific preparation for a sprint or even an Olympic distance race. The half Ironman is again, just as we talked about with the training, the half Ironman can go in like it can be just a wide variety of things depending on the athlete and the context. So somebody for whom the half Ironman is a pure endurance event that they're just going to, not just, but they're going to aim to complete rather than compete. And it's going to take them quite some time. They they are just mainly working on their endurance uh, to get that endurance up as much as possible. We can have a pretty long specific preparation for the half Ironman for somebody who is at that 
fast end of the spectrum, it can it can be quite a bit shorter because we have to keep in mind that if you're doing a lot of intense work, like there's only so long you can do that with frequency and with quality before you start to stop adapting positively to it and start adapting negatively to it instead. So, so it's, yeah, it, it, that, that's the reason. And that's why I'm saying that a sprint distance race, you would need just a quite short or, or a really short specific preparation period compared to an Ironman, because obviously the specific training you're doing for a sprint distance event is very intense. Uh, so, so that's, that's the timing component. Another, but another thing than just the event is also what previous events have the athlete done that season. So some, a very common scenario for, let's say, a half Ironman athlete is that they have already done two half Ironman events uh, previously in the year, and they're uh, working towards a third half Ironman in, in the autumn. And uh, if, let's say, they did six weeks of specific preparation for their first Ironman in the year, then maybe they don't need six for their second, and they definitely don't need six for their third. Because if you kind of stack things, or if you then take the year and look at, okay, how much specific work did we do? You can have athletes that race four or five half Ironmans, and then they end up doing 24 weeks of specific training. And I think that's just excessive, yeah. really. Yeah. So, so, So when you have already done a good period of specific preparation for your first race, uh, then you don't need to do the same amount for the for the second one. It's more about you still have some of that those adaptations, and it's more about reminding the muscles that it's there, and maybe taking a further percentage improvement in that for that for that next race. But but it's not you don't you're not starting from scratch. You have a lot of those previous adaptations there already. So so maybe they did. Uh, they did four to five weeks for that second race. And now for their third race, they only need two to three good weeks of specific preparation and, and they're good to go. So, so that's, that's kind of how the number of races and where they are in the season also play into play into it. Yep. Yep. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I have a curiosity question. If we go back to like say our time crunched athlete and, and maybe they're not as consistent as they're hoping to be and say they did like 70 percent of their general preparation we're four to six weeks out from uh, half iron man and we're just going to complete it would you then would you move to a specific training time period or would you stay in a general i would still uh, incorporate many aspects of the specific period because for this athlete all of the training that they're doing in the specific period is also going to be training that is beneficial for them long term. So yeah. again, it would still fall under that base training uh, if uh, definition, if uh, if that is the definition of it, as we talked about at the beginning. So in, for this athlete, maybe it doesn't matter so much that they they didn't do all of their the the work that they would have done in the general preparation. Uh, like it's it's all about being consistent really for for this athlete so so i at the end of the day i don't think it matters for for an athlete like that yeah. if they do more general training or more specific training it's it's not going to make too big a difference what's going to make a difference is that they can be consistent in those last 46 weeks but they might as well try to do some specific training in that period it's not going to be a negative compared to doing non-specific work, I don't think so. So I, I would, yeah, I would just try to do the best of those 46 weeks that they have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, nod to the consistency. I, I think if anybody um, extracts anything from this conversation, consistency is key over time. I mean, it helps you to not only uh, be more specific leading up to an event, but it also uh, creates more volume over time, which is, you know, kind of at the end of whatever time period you're looking at that, the number of hours actually that moves the needle on things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I know you said that there's no specific, say, say marker um, that you're looking at. If say somebody is very consistent coming up to a, um, a race specific time period, but just out of curiosity as well is, are, I mean, are you looking at metrics like FTP or stamina, or are you looking at a performance marker, like a power duration for um, say the projected, time period that they're going to be on course or any other like nerdy data points that we can just like 
sparked my curiosity about Michael. Yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely look at, at those things like in WKO, I, I do love it uh, as well. And, and it's really good, um, a really good tool for coaches. So, so I do look at, at FTP and model FTP stamina. I look at it. I, I don't care so much for it, to be honest. I look, I think the key thing that I look at is when we, when we're already in the specific period is the simulation workouts. So for an Ironman, for example, doing a five to six hour ride with three times one hour at, at, uh, Ironman race power. And, and, and especially when you have historical data from the athlete, if they also did that last year, then you can look at things like RPE and heart rate in that workout and compare those, those to me are the most, uh, yeah, the, 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 the most important things is really the simulation workouts and, uh, and how they trend over time. Um, but certainly, yeah, FTP or just general power duration numbers, uh, mean max powers over different distances depending on what the athlete has been training even though again you always have to take things into context maybe we haven't been doing maximal training per se so so a lot of it also comes down to how are they performing in non-specific workouts so let's say we've been in a vo2 max period look at okay so what are their numbers in in their intervals and and let's see okay what did they do last year that gives you a, mm-hmm. a directional piece of information about about how how the athlete is trending and where your view to max is at so um so yeah there, there's definitely looking at mean max powers ftp and so on but but mostly looking at performances in in race in in training and in potential tune-up tune-up races as well that that they have been doing yeah and i, and I think that you know that specificity um for the race in particular that you just described of you know um kind of simulating race course and going and doing that training. I mean, it definitely follows the training principles of specificity um, as well as creates durability uh, in a physical sense for that race time period. But I'd imagine that there's also some of this, um, you know, benefit of, uh, I don't know, durability psychologically that would go into knowing how to handle a course over time. Um, yeah. Am, am I right in that? Oh, ex- absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And and I think for Ironman, for example, one thing that I personally find useful is actually doing over distance bikes. So um, I was training for an Ironman uh, in 2020 that then in the end got canceled due to COVID. But hmm. I took a week where I just, I took as a training camp for myself and did a bit of work still, but but mostly I was I was just training and eating. And, and hmm. I did three rides that week of 200 plus kilometers i think there were 215 220 and 225 kilometers in in the space of a week there and and doing those rides that really completely changed my out- outlook on on the ironman uh, bike and my confidence going into it my yeah my mindset my psychology i i was just so much more confident about how i could perform after after those workouts that's not for everybody necessarily but but i think it it just it's an example of how how there is definitely a psychological component to to that type of work as well yeah so the the over distance on the bike basically what you're saying is you're doing just more volume on the bike in doing rides that are longer than i am distance in order to kind of prepare for that yeah so those those rides would have been in miles uh what like 140 uh i guess yeah 140 more or less around 140 and and the the ironman bike is 112 miles so uh so yeah all right um so for when you're working with an athlete on say the race simulations um are you actually bringing them to the course to get some of this coursework in are you simulating on uh like zwift or, or something like that or are you just finding what they have in the backyard in order to get this training done when it comes to some race simulation, be it swim, bike, or run? Uh, yeah, so all, all of those, really. Uh, I have had some examples of athletes that have done races, well, that are doing home races, and then definitely uh, when whenever possible, training on the race course is absolutely something something to, you should do, get, get to know the race course. And uh, I, I'm in that same scenario that I live very close to the Ironman Portugal race course. And, and I do try to uh, try to ride on it quite often, although 
maybe less often now because traffic is just pretty bad on on that particular stretch right? not bad in that it's unsafe but it's annoying you have to stop a lot yeah. so but but when whenever possible i think that yeah it's a it's a good thing to incorporate at least at least some some riding on the race course if you can uh, and and in terms of when when you're not living on the race course definitely i think that if you can still find similar type of terrain uh, in your backyard then absolutely make use of that that makes a whole lot of sense if you're going to do a hilly race then find hilly courses and ride on them if you're going to do a flat one then uh ride a lot on flat courses and and swift yes that too uh, i think not necessarily i a couple of times i have gone to the lengths of you know doing a best bike split plan and downloading it as an erg file or a swift file that the athlete can then ride in erg mode and so it's something that I do in certain situations, but more so in, in more general terms, I say, I think that we, we often think of Ironman and half Ironman, especially as very steady state affairs. So a typical workout would often be three times one hour at 75% of FTP, for example, would be a good mm-hmm. Ironman workout or uh, four times 20, 20 minutes at 85% for a 7.3 race. But depending on the on the race the athlete is training for, and also if they are pro and race dynamics are going to play a big part, then that's definitely not going to be the, the case. So for example, one uh, simulation workout that I do with, with some pros is to do something like six times 12 minutes, where the first 12 minutes is the hardest and then they're gradually decreasing slightly in power so that the average power is still slightly higher than their 7.3 average power. But basically that means that they start close to threshold for 12 yeah. minutes to, just to simulate the, the race dynamics. And and that's that's only the dynamic side of the thing. But then the other aspect is, of course, the terrain. So if you're, you live where you only have flats around you, but you're going to race a hilly course, then definitely you need to look at okay what what is the expected power profile are you going to have a good number of 10 20 minute climbs where you're closer to threshold not at threshold but closer than your average and then kind of coasting or pedaling more easily down for long stretches then the specific workouts are going to look more like that rather than the typical four times 20 at 85 percent which would be more of a standardized flat uh, flat course where race dynamics don't play a part yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess to, to bring this thing home, I mean, you know, we've been talking about um, durability over time. And so if an athlete puts these principles in, into play and they build themselves to be durable over time, what what is like the number one or two successful things that they can expect or identify in themselves, say, you know, a couple of weeks out from training that would identify themselves as, you know, being I'm durable. I, I'm, I'm ready for this thing. Yeah, I think that there's two things. Uh, one is just their performance in those workouts. And uh, especially for athletes where that is a limiter, then we are specifically working in workouts like that. One workout that I like to give athletes is a ride. It can be of any length, really. But let's say you're doing a three and a half hour endurance ride, but then you in the last kind of 45 minutes, you include 30 minutes straight at kind of tempo to uh, or half half Ironman race power. So, so w- when you can do that at the end of a kind of solid zone two ride, and and you feel better and better, then then you know that your durability is improving. Uh, so, so your performance in some key workouts is is one one way that you know that you're improving. And then the other thing is also just being able to go through your training program and recover better on a day-to-day basis i think i think as well has um, has something to do with durability and uh and, and when, when that happens when you have improved then uh it definitely helps athletes with with confidence especially those that uh that do tend to struggle in the latter part of races and have had experiences like that where they just fall apart in the last 10 kilometers on the run but when you put together a period when you when you really nail those durability workouts then uh, yeah the, the athlete gets an entirely new level of confidence in in their ability to perform on race day 
Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great um, summation of that. And speaking of summation, I think it's time to, to kind of hit these summary points, Michael, and uh, kind of package to our listeners everything that we have just discussed. So for the concepts of durability, like what are the couple couple points or takeaways that you want our listeners to remember about what durability is? Yeah, so or for what it is, it. yeah, so for what it is, just quickly, it's to minimize your performance uh, impairments when exercising for long durations and uh, to minimize how much you your performance impairs and at what point that happens and, and how to improve it. First of all, or number one, two, and three is just be consistent. That's, that's the number one thing. Secondly, I think that overall training volume has something to do with it. But as you pointed out earlier, of course, it's the same thing. You can't just think about increasing training volume. It's all contextual and, and needs to be done gradually and within other constraints of life and other stressors that you have. Uh, but but the overall training volume has, I think, a lot to do with, with your durability. Uh, and then I think doing long workouts in all three disciplines, if you're a triathlete, so doing 5K swims, doing an hour and a half to two hours on the run, doing five hours on the bike, those types of workouts help. And uh, and then secondly, to add a bonus point to that one, as I talked about with the bike example, adding some quality work towards the end of, of workouts like that uh, is is another piece of the puzzle. But you won't become a durable athlete just by doing those workouts if you're not consistent, if you don't have a reasonable overall training volume like an individual workout can only do so much there are no magic workouts uh, but then i also think one one thing that i think has something to do with durability even though i'm not sure is strength endurance workouts so for example low cadence work on the bike long hill reps or long hilly runs on the run so that's that's one thing that i'm not sure of but i i do think that i see a correlation between between that and durability I, I would agree with you on that. And just as a side note, uh, discussion point in our summary. Um, it, yeah, that, that's real for sure. And I think it's linked more toward that like peripheral uh, durability, if you will. Um, I, I oftentimes in my mountain bikers, you know, call it power for repeatability um, or on a hilly course, um, the ability to repeat those kind of specific locations or high force, you know, outputs. And, and there's there's some stuff that I look in in a power file to identify that. Um, however, I would say there's no one tool, say existing right now, that can identify some of that like strength endurance work or power for repeatability, specifically the way that I think you and I are talking about it. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, for sure, I see it as well. Um, to kind of to summarize this general and specific time period in, in, in my whole agenda here is to get people maybe looking at your periodization in a different way. But if you could uh, just kind of summarize the general to specific and then how, when to change, how would you summarize that whole kind of package of thinking about periodization? Yeah. So, so first of all, I think the main point to take away is that almost everything you're doing as an athlete is can be seen as building you as a better athlete long term so you don't necessarily need to distinguish anything really there is however as you talked about before the principle of specificity that there it, it does make some sense to do specific work close to the race so the way that i look at it and as we talked about in in this podcast is to have a specific preparation period that is event specific and uh, timing uh, timing dependent really and everything else is general preparation and uh so in and in the general preparation the key things are to just know why you're doing the training you're doing and that stems from really doing having a good idea of what your goals are where you currently stand and doing a gap analysis and looking at all of the things that you need to look at uh terrain competitive landscape event and so on so yeah that's in in very broad strokes that's that's how i would look at it uh, there's it's there's no magic that happens in any given phase so so i don't think you need to look at okay this is what i need to do to move from one phase to the next it's it's just semantics really but but if you accept the whole notion of doing some specific work closer to the race then you are going to do that and then basically use the rest of the time that you're not in those specific periods of training to work on what you need to improve to improve as an athlete 
both for the races that you're preparing for, but also in the long term. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And you kind of took away my, or, uh, you, you know, emphasize my final point is that, you know, there's no magic method. And as much as we're even talking about a simplistic method here of general and specific and kind of how you um, coach an athlete through a process, even that, I mean, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing magical about that other than organizing well, thinking through, you know, uh, strengths, weaknesses, what the athlete needs when, um, and delivering that through through the training process. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, I mean, we went long today, which is, which is always kind of my preferred and awesome, but like, uh, we touched on like so much, Michael, and I really want to thank you again for jumping on the train, right podcast and, and being a guest here. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation, Adam. And, and as for the length of the podcast, I've always been a believer that, uh, there's no right length. A podcast is as long as it needs to be, and, and that's the right length uh, for it. So, uh, so I, I, I hope that the listeners agree. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I, I hope the listeners agree too. And if they if they do agree, go ahead, give us that five star rating and say how much you liked Michael. And uh, uh, you know, you can catch us on um, Apple, Google, Spotify, all the places that you can get Michael's podcast as well, which is called that triathlon show in, in, and you can get them all in that, in those places, right, Michael? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. And if people are curious to follow you on social media, where are you most active there? Um, it's probably Instagram scientific triathlon HQ. Uh, we don't post to be honest, much more than the newly released episodes. I guess I am a bit active on Twitter as well. That's where sometimes I post a bit more, you know, personal views on training and at least I retweet some stuff fairly actively. So that's also scientific. What is it? No, it's side triad on Twitter because there's a character limit to your, to your handle there. Uh, so Twitter is a good place to follow me. Perfect. Yeah. And, uh, I guess final, I mean, what, can we get a sneak peek of some topics or guests that will be coming out on that triathlon show? Uh, yes. So we have that confidential information. No, no, it's not confidential. It's, it's actually that I did a ton of interviews in November, December, and oh, the okay. interviews that I'm releasing right now, as we're recording at the end of January are still recorded in that period. Now I'm coming to kind of the end of that line. So I'm going to have to gather up some guests, uh, soon. And I actually don't have that many episodes scheduled yet. Um, I think I have Marco Altini that will come on to talk about heart rate variability yep. quite soon. And uh, the other one that I have is Andy Kirkland is coming on, but that will probably be out, out already by the time this podcast is released, maybe because yep. it's coming out already in three days as we're recording. So um, yeah, Marco Altini is the one that is in the pipeline. And, and then I actually have some work to do next week to look at uh, who the next uh, batch of guests will be and, and invite them on the podcast. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, I look forward to those shows and um, we'll make sure that uh, that I go into my phone and, and download those for some long rides coming up. So yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks again, Michael. I, I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I appreciate it. Have a, have a great weekend. Thanks.